afternoon and welcome back from lunch. Hoping that you all had a light lunch so that, you know, we can accomplish the one goal of public speaking, which is for nobody to fall asleep. Um, but um, I think Barbara and I are really excited, I at least am, about the topic this year just because, you know, typically for our benefits sessions, we're doing things that are pretty technical in nature. And that's a necessity, really, because benefit plans are by their nature um, governed by a lot of technical requirements, whether it's ERISA or the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, so naturally, we're constantly updating our clients with new regulations and guidance and things that have come out and going kind of very in-depth into those specific regs. But now with, you know, the things like webinars that we put on and, and client alerts that we send out via email, we can get a lot of that information out more real time. And so it leaves us an opportunity in these seminars to get back to some of the more practical implications of administering benefit plans and um, go more to, you know, the 50,000 foot level about things that maybe you should be doing and keeping in mind throughout the year and, and ongoing um, as kind of overall picture ideas behind your plan. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the topic. I think we're going to delve less into very specific uh, regs and things like that and keep more into giving you some best practices ideas, which is really the goal. And so when we did this, we titled it Action Steps for Employers in 2014. And I, I don't want to give the impression that this is like a things you have to do in 2014. That is not what this is. This is just kind of, 2014 is just an idea of if you've not done some of the things that we have listed in here, these are some ideas and suggestions of things to put on your to-do list as a benefit plan administrator. And where this really comes from is all of us get really busy in our day-to-day -day operations, whatever the the you know latest emergency is or fire drill that's coming in, whether it's a participant with questions or outsiders coming in with questions about what's happening with a benefit plan, everyone gets busy with the day-to-day -day busy things and then some of the more global issues that are related to your benefit plans can get overlooked or maybe neglected for a period of time. And so, you know, something, you know, out of the ordinary occurs or major occurs, such as a DOL audit or an IRS audit, um, or maybe your company is going to sell to a buyer and that buyer wants all of this information from you that you've not looked at in a while. And so you're scrambling to, to gather that information. Or if you have a participant complaint about, you know, what benefits they're entitled to, those out of the ordinary things come up and you, it's only in those moments, you know, we see with clients that you realize some of the things that have been neglected for a while. And so what we're hoping is that maybe some of these things, if you have not done them in a while, you'll, you'll inject them into your to-do list and calendar them for a time that you're going to set aside where you're going to look at these specific issues and make sure that you're on the right path. So the first of those to-dos is to conduct a plan inventory. And this is actually a very simple process. It should be simple at least. And some of you hopefully are really already completely where you need to be for the slide that I'm about to talk about. But I know from experience that a lot of you probably are not. And it's something you can do easily that's going to put you in a situation where you're not flat-footed if one of those out-of-the-ordinary events happens like an audit or something like that. So first, identify all of your employee benefit plans that you maintain. And that may seem silly because you think, how would I not know what the benefit plans are that I maintain or that our company maintains? But really, oftentimes, uh, people have what are benefit plans and that may be subject to requirements of ERISA or the Internal Revenue Code, and they don't realize that that program is subject to it. They just assume it's more of an informal program that's not subject to all of the standard regulations. And so really take a step back and think about all of the benefits that are being provided to the employees, no matter how informal, and enter into a conversation, whether it be with your legal counsel or with the service providers, to whether or not that's a plan that's subject to ERISA or it's subject to the IRS. What, or the IRC. Once you've identified those plans, then figure out if you've got all the executed documents associated with those plans. One of the first things that's going to be asked of you if you're ever audited or if someone's ever buying your company or if a participant has a question is, I'd like to see the plan documents. And that seems simple, but I can't tell you the number of times that I've either asked a client to provide me with their executed plan document and they don't know what constitutes the plan document because there's so many papers going around about your plan that you're not even necessarily sure what is the governing document. 
uh, or they've just they they've lost track of the the signature page, so they don't have an executed version. We get asked all the time if we have an executed version for clients uh, because they've lost theirs, and so it's really important to maintain an organized system for every benefit plan you have and to keep track of those executed documents because that's really where you're going to go to. Um, also, if you had amendments, make sure that those are wherever it is that you keep your plan. Because if you get asked a question about how about plan interpretation or something to that effect, and you've amended a provision of the plan, but you're not looking at it, well, then you're giving somebody out-of-date information. And it's easy to forget about an amendment that you did three years ago. And so just make sure that all of your files are really organized and that they're prepared to the extent that anybody wants to come in and audit what it is that you have. SPDs, they're very frequently out of date. It happens all the time. A few months ago, I had an individual call me and say, we just got a call from the DOL. They're coming to audit us. And they just asked us for an SPD in our plan, and I just pulled it out, and it's been nine years since we've updated it. Well, of course, they've had amendments and plan restatements and everything else since then, and so the SPD is certainly out of date, not only because they should have updated it more frequently than that and distributed it more frequently, but because it also has wrong provisions. So check all your SPDs. Make sure that for all the benefit plans you have that require SPDs, that you have the SPD and that it's up to date, and that if it's not been distributed recently, that you're on target to distribute it. Because more likely than not, you know, once a participant asks you for an SPD, you're required to give it to them. And if you don't give it to them within a short window of time, then you're going to start being penalized um, by Department of Labor penalties and so and those are pretty extensive so you you're left with a choice at that point if yours is out of date do I rush to get one that is up to speed and that has all of the things in it that we need to have and so it's not a great process and maybe that means it's not going to be a great product that you have at the end of the day or do I give them this out of date document that if they use it may not give them the right answer and neither one of those is a good answer um, to the question and so you know the goal is to stay on top of these things before they become something that somebody's looking for. Um, so I would just recommend keeping calendar items for those things to always stay on top of it and to check your files, make sure they're staying up to date. And then certainly with 5500s, make sure that if you're required to report on a plan that you're reporting it, we get all the time, we, we're constantly filing delinquent filer um, notices with a DOL on behalf of clients because they weren't aware that one of their benefit plans is required to have a 5500 file. Um, sometimes those voluntary benefits that you're offering really don't qualify for the safe harbor, and so therefore you should be filing a 5500 on that voluntary policy that you offer to employees. Make sure that you know that you have an exemption from a 5500, and if you're not positive, ask somebody because that does come with penalties and, and you want to stay on top of that. The next item Barbara will cover. Yes, and here, I don't know, can you guys hear me? No. No? It's on. Now? There we go. Okay. Uh, and this is just determining what's known as control group status. And if you're not familiar with that term, really the, the purpose behind it is uh, determining which entities that you had, for which you administer benefit plans are going to be required to be combined together for purposes of things like non-discrimination testing, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which we'll talk about later on today, um, counting employees, those kinds of things. It's not just your office necessarily that uh, you have to be aware of. And so the purpose behind our next kind of to-do list is making sure that you're absolutely aware of what's out there, who's being counted, and various issues related to those topics. So the first one is to determine whether you operate a benefit plan for a parent subsidiary group, a brother-sister group, or a combined control group. And those have very specific meanings. Um, and we can kind of hit the highlights of them, but there, it's a, it can be a pretty complicated analysis and one that you should consult uh, with somebody, if, with legal counsel, if you guys are, you know, questioning that analysis at all. But for purposes of the parent subsidiary group, we're talking about the 80% common ownership. So if corporation or LLC owns 80% or has 80% control over another corporation, then they're going to be in a group together. And so if there's a benefit plan in the first corporation and also in the second corporation, those will likely need to be combined for purposes of testing. And that's 
you know, there's more to it than, than that, but that's kind of the overview of the parent subsidiary. And kind of the same thing with what's known as a brother-sister control group. Uh, it's the five or fewer individuals who are in a common ownership situation. And that one is a little bit more complicated and, again, would encourage you to consult with somebody if you are questioning that. But we're looking, again, at 80% ownership and then 50% of what's known as identical ownership. That's the tricky piece, and that's something that, uh, again, you can, you can look into if you need to and if you haven't already. But the, the big purpose of that and kind of going on with the affiliated service group issue, too, which we'll get to in a second, is just to determine who's being treated as what's known as a single employer. Are you a single employer with a bunch of different entities? Are you a single employer just on your own as one entity? Um, and what does that mean for non-discrimination testing and you know, various compliance issues like the Affordable Care Act? Um, moving on to affiliated service groups, uh, there are several different types of what's called an affili affiliated service group, sorry. Um, and specifically, I think that the probably biggest uh, issue that I've seen with respect to affiliated service group is is the setting where we have a management services company operating specifically for another entity. And if for any reason you would like to offer separate plans to a management services company and another entity, then you might want to check into that because it, there are likely going to be you know red flags there. So it's just different things, different ways to combine uh, various entities within a big umbrella of the corporation or the part or the LLC, um, and making sure that you are kind of tracking the number of employees within each one, who's highly compensated, who's non-highly compensated, and then what do I need to do as an administrator to be able to comply with the requirements of the Internal Revenue Code, which can be tricky. Um, and kind of the the last couple of points I've already mentioned. Um, for the Affordable Care Act, we're looking at uh, that, that 50 or more magic number for determining who's a large employer and whether you need to comply. And so in that situation, and this is again going to be hit on later in the, in the afternoon, but for that situation, if you are only looking at who's in your office and you think, okay, well, I've got 20 employees in my office and we offer a, a health plan to all of them, it meets the minimum essential coverage testing and, it, you know, it, we've checked all the boxes. Well, are you looking at all of the entities? Are you looking at not only the parent corporation there, but, you know, subsidiary A, our office in Tulsa um, and, you know, other issues that might come into play there? I, it's all too often that people don't consider the big picture. And I think that's what we're trying to hammer home today is making sure that you're not only looking at who is in my office, what are the plans that we're administering here, but then what other plans might I be responsible for with respect to the larger company. So, and then again, the last point, just ensure that testing, the non-discrimination testing that I've been mentioning is being done appropriately. If you're going to be considered a single employer for purposes of these, this control group analysis, then you want to make sure that you're including all of the employees that need to be tested. And that can be you know, a very large number, and it can also inc include a lot of individuals that you might not uh, think of. So you want to kind of conduct an inventory of what offices do we actually operate, or for which we operate benefit plans, and then uh, who are the employees within those offices? What are what's their compensation level, and what you know all of the good issues that go along with non-discrimination testing, which I think is everybody's favorite. I know it's mine, um, but I, you know, just looking at all of those big picture items so that you can make sure that you are compliant. And I think that the next one is moving on to plan versus operation analysis and. What this really means and kind of what we're getting at here is does my employee benefit plan, do the terms in that plan mirror what we're doing in our administration of that plan? And this seems so simple and you would think, well, gosh, sure it does. I, you know, I do my job every day. I am doing things accordingly. I know what our plan provides. I know what we're supposed to do. But you'd be surprised. Uh, there are lots of really minute, detailed terms within your plan uh, that can cause major issues. And if you're not administering it accordingly, then 
for you know what Allison was talking about with respect to DOL audits and IRS audits. Those can really bring some major penalties and, and some issues involved. So the first action item for the to-do is to check your plan provisions. And again, this seems really simple, but seriously, go through, and if you have time, and if, if you can uh, make the time for it, you know, check things like compensation. What does that mean? Are you administering it accordingly? So you can uh, have a plan that would provide the compensation only includes W-2 wages, but another plan might provide that it includes W-2 wages and W-2 wages and any bonus, and those can provide those can bring you know specific hurdles that, that would uh, would be difficult to administer depending on the situation. So check to see exactly what that definition of compensation is, and if it's not supposed to include bonuses, then what do we need to do about it? Do we need to amend the plan? Do we want to include bonus compensation? Uh, or do we need to just you know, effectively quit the practice of including it? And when we talk about including, we're talking about all different types of reasons to include, um, you know, for purposes of testing, for purposes of uh, elective deferrals, what is the definition of, for instance, compensation? Um, kind of the same thing going along with contributions, uh, vesting requirements, and you know, just making sure that what you are doing in practice is actually in accordance with the plan term itself. And again, that sounds very easy, but one little word can mean you know, a big, a big issue can mean some liability and exposure, and you don't want that to happen. Uh, the, the other point on that is something just in general that I've seen recently, and I think it's probably in direct relation to the, uh, to the regs that were issued last year, but the FSAs have specifically been a little bit of an issue because of the new, you know, you can either have the rollover if your company provides an, a flexible spending account, or you can administer the grace period. Um, and it's an either-or situation, and so you want to make sure that what you're doing now, if you amended your plan to provide for that new $500 rollover benefit, that you're actually implementing that and doing it appropriately. Um, and again, I just bring that up specifically because it seems like it's been a little bit of a hot issue lately. But uh, if you, you know, either-or, the grace period, some plans don't have either, and uh, administer administrators are administering one. So make sure that your plan, the flexible spending account, does at least provide for one or the other if you're doing one. Uh, the next part is just to ensure that the TPA also, the third party administrator, is administering the, the plan appropriately. And I know that we have a lot of TPAs in here, and so it's not a knock on TPAs at all. What it really is is, the, is reminding the plan sponsor and whoever administers the plan on behalf of the plan sponsor that they ultimately are responsible. And so as much as you can, and you can trust a TPA to, do, you know, to administer the terms of the plan in the way that you would want them to do so, and even if you've had a long-term relationship, it's still really important that you... In, you you ensure and check and make sure that your TPA is is following all of those terms in the way that you need them to be followed. And that's just to limit your exposure and your liability um, to make sure that you're, you know, on behalf of the plan sponsor doing everything that you should be doing and checking all of the boxes. Um, updating the plan document if necessary. This kind of goes back to what Allison was talking about with amendments. If, if, for instance, we were talking about the definition of compensation, if you would like for the definition of compensation, if the company wants it to include bonuses and it's not, then go ahead and, and talk about amending the plan. And that's fine. Uh, and, and do that, but make sure that you are keeping track of when you do it, how you do it, and then that you're doing, you're following all of those steps accordingly. You can't, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, can't we just start doing that? Well, it's going to likely require a plan amendment. And there are specific terms usually in your plan document, or at least they probably should be there, that will tell you exactly how to get that amendment done. And so to the extent that you uh, want that done, then consult counsel, consult whoever, and go ahead and do it. But make sure that it's, it's mirroring the plan's terms for that actual amendment. Um, and kind of the last part wraps right up into that, just making sure that you've checked all your boxes with how you're supposed to do the plan amendment. So, Well, and one last thing on that. I mean, the easiest thing to do, and, and I've done this with several clients, is to call them and say, okay, you know, it's been a while, let's dust off the plan document, because oftentimes clients will call and ask me a question, and I'll start quoting something from the plan document and realize that they've not looked at the plan document in a really long time, and that's not unusual. I mean, it's like getting your car insurance policy, and have you ever even read it? So, 
you know, you can spend all this time designing a plan and then all of a sudden that plan gets shelved for a while before you ever really look at its terms again. So it's, it's really just a good exercise. And I do this with clients. We just walk through the plan document together and hit the highlights and make sure that that's still the way it's being done. I mean, it's so easy to mess up a compensation definition because payroll may be dealing with the codes that are used to determine where money's getting deducted from and you have nothing to do with it and it's just not being done the way that it's supposed to be doing. So a lot of times that review isn't just myself and the client, it's the TPA, it's somebody from payroll. It's just everybody kind of walking through periodically. It doesn't need to be done all the time, but you probably need to do it, you know, at least every couple of years, familiarize yourself with the plan again because you'll you'll be surprised at the number of things that you can catch that you just inadvertently um either misremembered what the goal was um, or just it got changed along the way for some other reason. Payroll changed a code for some reason that had nothing to do with your 401k and didn't realize the impact that it would have on it because that's not their job. So really good exercises to go through because things can go askew without you having done anything really. So the next to-do item is the reviewing and analyzing of 408b2 disclosures. Unlike some of the other ones, this is one that you really have to do. I mean, I would say that this is a constant, ongoing item that needs to be on your to-do list because you're ultimately responsible for making sure that you're receiving from your service providers the disclosures that they're required to give you for purposes of ERISA 408b2. And what this basically was for in the first place, for those, I'm sure that all of you are fully aware of 408b2 at this point because you've probably been receiving a ridiculous amount of documents from providers that have all kinds of information and then it's really hard to dissect. But just to back it up a little bit, the goal of this is that technically speaking, you're not supposed to be able to contract with a service provider for the plan because that's a prohibited transaction. But the DOL provides you an exemption for that to the extent that the services you're getting are you know, necessary and that the compensation that the provider is getting is reasonable. So as part of that exemption, now one of the things you have to do to retain that exemption from the prohibited transaction is the service providers have to provide you with all of this information regarding the services that they provide and the compensation that they receive because otherwise, from the DOL's perspective, how is it that you're making the call as to whether or not what they're doing for you is, is adequate and that, this, and that the amount of money that they're receiving is really reasonable based off what their what the services are. So that's why this even came into play. And so because it's in play and because it's a prohibited transaction that you also would be a party to as the plan sponsor if it happened and would owe excise taxes on, it's important that you make sure that you you know stay on top of your service providers and make sure that they're doing it. Even though it's something they're supposed to do, you have to make sure it's happening. And so the first thing, go through Number one, this only applies to retirement plans. So put your health and welfare plans aside for a second. So all of your service providers that you have for your retirement plans, have you received from them a 408B2 disclosure? And if you're not sure, then just contact them and say, have you given me my 408B2 disclosure? And if you haven't, can, can you send it to me? And if you have, can you resend it to me? Because I want to make sure I know where the information is that I'm supposed to be relying on for purposes of complying with this reg. The service providers you should be receiving this from would be like your investment consultant, if you have an investment consultant on your plan, any ERISA fiduciary to your plan. So a record keeper that's also offering an investment product on your platform that you're offering to employees, those people should all be providing you with 48B2 disclosures. Additionally, if there are other more ancillary services that are being provided to you by someone, whether it's actuarial services or legal services, accounting services, it can be any range of things, consulting of any kind. If they're receiving indirect compensation of any kind of substantial amount, they should also be providing them to you. So typically I wouldn't be providing a, a, a disclosure to any of the plans that I work with because I'm not receiving indirect compensation. I'm being paid directly by the plan or the plan sponsor. So there is no indirect compensation being received by me and I'm not an ERISA fiduciary for that plan. So there is that difference. But for all the ones you would expect, for all the ones that you think may be receiving 12B1 fees or things like that from the investments that are offered, they should all be providing these to you. So make sure you have a list of all the providers that should be sending this to you and then go through 
and make sure that they've given it to you, whether it's by just knowing they're there or by contacting them. Then make sure that it has all the information that it needs to have in there, that it's got a list of services, that they're telling you if there's a conflict of interest. They're telling you whether or not the fees are reasonable. Those things should all be occurring. Um, and then consider whether or not, if, if, if you're not sure about whether or not the fees are reasonable, because it's very, I mean, the things that they're going to provide you, I mean, they're intended to provide you with information, but they really can be incredibly convoluted and difficult to understand to know what, what you're even really paying them. They have a bunch of percentages and things, but then it gets to the bottom and you're not sure what the total compensation even is. And so if you need help understanding those things, consider hiring um, a third-party expert in that area, an investment consultant. They don't have to, You don't have to enter into a long-term arrangement with them. There are plenty out there that will perform literally the only thing they'll do for you is provide a benchmark for you based off your 408B2 disclosures of how you're doing in comparison to similar employers in your situation and whether or not your fees are reasonable. And it's not just a question of are you just the lowest. They don't have to be the lowest. And you don't necessarily want them to be. It's not, it's not intended to provide a race to the bottom. It's, it, you know, if you're getting great service, you're going to pay more in fees. And that's just, that's the way that it should be. But if it needs to balance out. So if you're not, if you don't have somebody that's reviewing that, that has a lot of expertise in the area or just any experience really with it, I would highly recommend seeking out just some independent advice at least once. It doesn't have to be every year to the extent that they're coming in and are similar, but at least once. Let's check it out. Let's make sure that, that you're not overpaying substantially and that the participants aren't overpaying substantially for the services that are being provided. Um, you can also consider an RFP. People are typically hesitant to do that because they think that it's going to be a long process and expensive and all of that good stuff. And it can be, but it really is a process that I would recommend everyone go through with respect to their service providers at least every three to five years. It really puts you in a situation where everybody, your current provider is going to reevaluate whether or not what they're receiving is still reasonable or if it's become, you know, a lot of times there's percentages taken off of things. Well, three years from now, your assets may have grown substantially. And so now what they're receiving is extraordinarily more than what they're receiving the first year of your contract. And that needs to be adjusted. And they're not just going to show up to you one day and say, hey, we'd like to adjust our fee schedule down so that you're not paying as much. It rarely happens. But when you go out to RFP, they're certainly going to let you know, oh yeah, these are ways that we can cut costs for you. And then you're also going to be getting some input in from other providers as to what you can have. And it's a great process to go through. Um, and it really provides kind of the protection you need as the plan fiduciary to say that we have done our fiduciary duty. We have prudently gone through the process to make sure that the providers that we are hiring for this plan are doing a good job and they're doing it at a reasonable rate of compensation. The next thing that just kind of goes along with the, the service provider disclosures to you as the plan sponsor are the disclosures that have to go to the participants, which are the 404 disclosures from ERISA. These are really because, these are also, again, we're just talking about retirement plans, and these are really for participant-directed investment plans, so your 401k and plans that are similar to that, where the participant is really the one who's making the decision as to what they're investing their assets in. And the DOL has basically said, listen, if, if you're going to have these participant-directed investments and you're going to remove some of the liability from yourself as to how those investments perform, then you've got to make sure that they're getting all of the information that they would need to make an informed decision. So to do that, they instituted some final rules under 404 of ERISA to say that you've got to provide all this information with respect to your investments on a pretty frequent basis so that participants know what to base their decisions off of. I'm going to skip the deadlines for now and just move to what it is that is supposed to be in these. So that, and then I'll talk about when those are supposed to be taken care of. The first type of information that is required in the participant disclosures is the plan-related information. And this, is, this really falls into like three categories. There's the general information where you should be telling them how they, you know, how do I make an investment election? Well, that should be clear from the information that they're getting. What is the list of options that I have available to me? Is there a brokerage window? Just giving them general information about their ability to invest it on their own. The next would be administrative expenses. So this is for the plan as a whole. So if the plan has fees and expenses that are being charged to the individual accounts, what are those fees and expenses? Um, 
and then individual expenses. So there are times when there are specific fees and expenses associated with a specific participant's account that are being taken based off of activities of that participant, whether it's a loan or a quadro or something like that. All that information should be in there for them so that they can see, okay, if I do a loan, the processing fee is $50, and it's going to be charged to my account just so they're fully aware of what it is. So those things need to be included. And then on the investment-related information side, there should be performance data. There should be benchmarks on that performance data. And typically we're talking, I mean, it has to be at, at a minimum one, five, and 15-year returns that are being showed to them on every investment option. And the benchmark is there to provide kind of a broad-based like securities index so that they can see, you know, use it as a comparison to whatever it is that they're invested in. And then in addition to that, you're going to have fees and expenses on there that are related to the investment. So separate and apart from the record keeping fees and things like that that are going to be up in your plan related information. This is expenses at the investment level. Uh, so those should be included there. A, a direction to a website where they can get even more information should be clearly set so that you can see, they can see where it is they can go to get more information. And then all that information needs to be provided in a comparative format whether it's a chart or something similar that makes it easy for them to look at all the investment options available and do a side-by-side -side comparison so that it's not, so that it really is apples to apples when they're looking at the different choices that they have. Um, so those are the two major things. Both of those things that have to be provided, must be provided on or before the date that a person becomes eligible to direct investments in the plan. So this is, this is really important that you have in your procedures when you have new hires that come in that part of their enrollment kit has to do with these disclosures. So if you have a retirement plan that's subject to this, you've got to make sure that you're keeping up-to-date information and that it's going into enrollment kits whenever you have new employees that will become eligible to participate in that plan because they're required to have it before that time. And in addition, it's got to be provided annually thereafter. So, you know, the regs went into effect in August of 2012, so a lot of people sent out their disclosures at that time. That means that you, within the next 12 months, it has to go out again. So you've got to make sure that you know the date that your last disclosures went out, and you've got to make sure that you're within 12 months providing updated documents. And that requires a lot of work with your service providers to make sure that those, that information that needs to go out to participants is being provided to you well in advance. So set a calendar reminder at least a couple of months, if not three, in advance of whenever that deadline is, just to remind you, okay, I need to contact our providers and I need to make sure that we're getting this information so that we can timely get it out to the participants. Because if you don't, then you're basically losing the protection that you get from the negative performance that some of those investments may have. So if somebody invests and it goes terribly wrong, then you've lost that protection from the liability associated with their choices because the point is that you've not provided them the information that they needed. So it's really important to keep this not only, so if there are people that handle enrollment that are different than you, you need to make sure that you coordinate with them so that they know that that's one of the things that needs to go out with those kits. Um, you also just, um, if there's a failure and those happen, just need to coordinate with your plan service provider to make sure that you get them out as quickly as possible so that you're covering yourself as much as you can with respect to things that you really have very little control over. Okay, the next topic is to uh, consider a wrap plan. And should you consider one or do you need it at all? Uh, and for this purpose, a lot of you may be familiar with a wrap plan, but some of you may not. And what we're talking about here is one big umbrella document, one big huge plan document to cover all of the specific little, um, I say little, but relatively you know smaller benefit components within that large umbrella. Typically here we're talking about health and, health and welfare plans. There's really, I haven't seen too much of the uh, wrapping together of re retirement plans. So kind of put the retirement plan discussion aside for now. We're talking, you know, health and welfare. Um, but there's a, a few different reasons that you would do this. Allison touched on this just a little bit ago uh, with respect to for filing the 5500s. To the extent that you have been delinquent or your company has been delinquent in filing the 5500s, then uh, it's easier to get a 
umbrella document for purposes of filing. So you can only do only have to do one, and you know you can go back on the uh, through the years to see which ones you missed, and then just file one time, which is helpful. Uh, kind of a, a bigger, more global purpose, and one that's more on a pro perspective basis as opposed to uh, the 5500 issue, is just for purposes of compliance, having everything in one place. And it makes it a little bit easier. So we're going to go through this to-do list and kind of keeping those, those things in mind about why you might, as a company, consider uh, having a wrap plan document in place. Uh, the first is to determine the number of health and welfare plans you administer. If you only have a medical plan document and maybe a dental plan document, um, it may not be in your best interest to have an, an umbrella wrap plan. It, it may be. You may still want one, and that's fine. But really what we're talking about here is when a, a, a company offers you know, a health plan, a flexible spending account, a DCAP, uh, the voluntary benefits, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, anything that might be considered a health and welfare plan that's going to require a certain amount of disclosure requirements and filing, uh, you know, so that we can have it all in one place. So if you have a lot of those, then this might be a very good option for you. Um, and the next thing is to determine the participant accounts in each plan. And this is really for purposes of filing the 5500. Uh, should we have everything in one place so that, we, so that we only have to file one time? Well, how many employees do we have? These are the kinds of considerations that you might want to be consider or looking at to determine whether you want the wrap plan. And when we're, when we're talking about participant counts here, uh, just so we're all on the same page, that term can be a little bit confusing. And it really, it just means the, the number of employees or former employees, so COBRA, qualified beneficiaries, who are in the plan. So we're not talking about dependents. We're not talking about globally who all is participating in the plan. We're really just looking at the number of employees. And if, for instance, on the health plan you have 100 or more, um, and you also have 100 or more on the dental plan and on the employer-sponsored life insurance plan and on the short-term disability, you know, going on and on and on, then the RAP plan document would be able to combine all of those benefits in one place so that for purposes of, for instance, the summary plan description that we were talking about just a minute ago, you would only really have to have one document that was sent out and given to the participants as opposed to here's an SPD for the health plan, here's an SPD for the dental plan, on and on and on. And it can become quite cumbersome. I think that a lot of times people forget uh, just how many benefits they are operating. And so when you get to things like open enrollment and when you get to things like uh, new hires, then you know, you've got a stack of documents this high. And each will require certain disclosures and certain uh, filings. And so that's why we're talking about potentially putting them all into one place. Um, and kind of on that same note, uh, determine whether your disclosure uh, liability has been difficult to date. Is it, is it hard for our company to send out, you know, 15 SPDs each year, or not each year, but, you know, 15 summary of material modifications, if we did those for each plan? Is that difficult to do? Uh, do we want to only have to do that one time? And those kinds of considerations. Um, and I touched on this, and I kind of want to touch on it a little bit more because I think it's important. When we're talking about um, compliance for disclosures and, and those uh, specific issues, um, you know, we're really talking about ERISA. We're talking about the, the code, Internal Revenue Code. But, you know, let's just focus on ERISA for now and those voluntary benefits, that buzzword that we've, we've kept talking about. Um, you know, there are... Uh, most companies will offer, or, or a lot of companies will offer uh, you know, a health plan or you know a dental plan, but then they'll also offer those voluntary benefits to where there's no employer contributions. It's just kind of a here's what we what we have. We contracted with this you know third party to get this good rate for you guys, and we're going to let you uh, enroll in that, and we'll administer the payroll deductions to the extent that it's necessary, but we're not going to provide anything other than that. You need to be careful and actually look at those benefits, those life, those group life insurance benefits, those short-term disability plans, long-term disability plans uh, that you would otherwise consider to be truly voluntary. Because like Allison was saying, there's a safe harbor that if 
if there aren't employer contributions and if there aren't a certain you know number of things, then those really will be con considered voluntary. And that means they won't be subject to ERISA. They won't trigger the SPD uh, requirement. They won't trigger other disclosure and filing requirements like the Form 5500. However, that is becoming one of the kind of hot issues that we're seeing because uh, the, there's one little term in that safe harbor, and that is uh, whether the benefit has been endorsed by the employer. And that can mean a whole slew of things. That can mean something as simple as including it in your open enrollment materials and saying, here's what we have, or saying, here's, we think this is a good option for you. So be very careful that just because you think that a plan does not have employer contributions. It's a you know a fully insured benefit, and really, it, there's really not very much that the employer would do or that payroll would process other than the, than the salary reju reductions. Uh, be very careful that that is not in fact an ERISA benefit, and that it is not in fact required to be reported on the 5500. So that kind of issue, those kinds of considerations, would be a very good reason to have a wrap document so that. You don't have to worry too much about what are we doing for this specific voluntary life insurance benefit. Instead, we can worry about what we're doing for the entire plan as a whole because typically what we do for then the health plan document, the dental plan, the vision benefit, all the things that you would already normally think of to do, uh, you're doing for all. So it's just an easier way to kind of hammer home your compliance uh, and, and check the boxes for what you need to be doing. The next thing to place on the to-do list, if you have a severance plan or program that you administer, um, we're talking to you. <laughs> and a lot of people have these just in their employee manual, and they kind of disregard them. There's like a statement as to what type of severance would be provided in certain events, and they don't have a separate document, so they don't really think about it. There, there is the potential that a severance plan or program is subject to ERISA. And that goes unnoticed by a lot of employers. They think of it as more of just a compensatory thing that's not subject to any other requirements. Uh, that's not true. It is oftentimes that severance programs, certainly severance programs that are pretty formal and that are ongoing, anything that requires some kind of ongoing administration, whether it's, you know, if you're not paying it in a lump sum immediately on a one-off situation, and if there is a determination as to whether or not you're eligible under the program based off of your years of service and all this stuff, then that's requiring some level of employer administration of that program. And in those situations, it becomes questionable as to whether or not you're an ERISA plan. And if you're an ERISA plan, then obviously you've got a lot of disclosure requirements and things like that that you have to comply with that you're probably not if you've never considered whether or not yours is. The other obvious thing that we've been talking about a lot today is 5500s. To the extent that your entire company is eligible for that severance in the event that certain events happen regarding their employment, then technically, for purposes of whether or not you have to file a 5500, they're considered a participant. Even though they've not severed, they're still working. And that just doesn't you know, resonate with a lot of people because it doesn't, frankly, make a lot of sense because they're not benefiting under the program yet. But the point is that they could. And so even though it's an easy 5500 to file because there's not a lot of information, to be on the safe side, it's best to just go ahead and file it if you're on that line. So take a good look at your severance programs if you have one. If you don't, if you're just, if you are, you know, not, if you don't have a single thing that is formalized and if someone terminates and it's a one-off decision that you're going to provide that person with severance, I'm not talking about that. Those are not situations where you need to worry about anything. This is really a situation where a lot of people stand to benefit under the same plan at some point in time if things happen. That's what we're talking about. So check into that. Make sure that you're not one of those and that you've adequately made sure that you're not an ERISA plan. Second, check and make sure that you don't have a severance program if you do have one that's subject to 409A. And, you know, 409A is just basically a complicated tax provision that says if you're providing the right to compensation in one year that's not going to be paid until a later year, they consider that to be deferred compensation. So very oftentimes severance plans will provide somebody with compensation on an, on an extended period where they're just continuing salary. In those situations, if you're going to be paying that person the next year and they've got to write this year to it and they know that they're going to keep getting those amounts, the IRS would say, okay, well, that's deferred compensation and so it has to be compliant with 409A unless you're exempt for some reason. Well, if you've not prepared for that or thought of that, 
a lot of times you're certainly not going to be compliant because a lot of the ways that you define terms and things like that are specific to how they have to be defined in 49A. So it's unlikely that if you have a plan that is subject to it, that you just lucked into a compliant plan. Highly unlikely. There is a possibility that the way that you're paying it out could luck into an exemption um, related to severance pay. But if you're paying anybody because of a voluntary leave or retirement, you're out of that exception. And so really and truly, if you have a program that provides extended payments, have somebody look into whether or not that document is subject to 49A. Because if it is, you want to immediately get it reviewed and check to make sure that it's got all the terms in it that are necessary to keep it preferably out of 49A. There are plenty of exemptions you could take um, advantage of if you just structure the program appropriately. And that's certainly the preference. You don't really want to be subject to 49A because compliance with it is really um, complicated and something that you have to endure for the duration of that plan. And it will limit the way that you can change that plan going forward. So it's really something you don't want to be subject to. Um, confirm that you're properly handling any severance that you're paying from a tax standpoint. Very typical for a lot of employers to think that we're giving somebody severance after they've left to 1099 them. Not the case. That's still compensation. They should be W-2'd for that compensation. If they were an employee and they terminated, severance should be W-2'd to them, not 1099'd. Um, additionally, there's been this debate and this hope that severance pay wasn't subject to FICA. Not true. Uh, for It's always been not true for most severance plans. There was some discussion as to whether or not with certain specific plans you could avoid FICA. Um, it's recently come down from a court ruling that's really not a good position to be taking anymore. So that's kind of ruled out too. So make sure that you're paying taxes on it properly and, and record keeping those taxes. And then finally, make sure that you're accounting for that in your other benefit plans. A lot of benefit plans deal with severance and what benefits you're entitled to post severance, especially your 401k compensation is impacted by severance pay. So your plan may provide that certain amounts of severance pay should be included as something that can be deferred from. Make sure that anything that's going out in severance is properly being treated under those plans as well because you're not just worried about the severance itself. And then the last piece of this, and to wrap things up, is just to review your administrative guide, uh, governance. And we've kind of touched on this in a few different capacities with respect to the disclosure notices and you know other issues that we've already talked about. But just kind of some highlights. Uh, the first to-do action item, review and update your required policies and procedures. And here we're talking about all kinds of policies and procedures, you know, administrative committee stuff, we can kind of lump that in, uh, investment com committee procedures. Um, but also the regulatory procedures that you think you might be compliant with that you know new things come out all the time like HIPAA and COBRA your quadro notices and procedures I there was a we talked to a client the other day that uh, wanted the their 401k plan to be in compliant with the quadro procedures and they said in the plan that hey we can offer you these but they didn't have any to offer so you know those kinds of issues if your plan provides that you need to offer something make sure that it's there for you to offer um, and with the HIPAA stuff especially uh, you know that those new regs came out uh, last year, and then we had that September deadline for the updated business associate contracts, and uh, and there were different things in those regulations that are are diff are new. Um, for instance, a risk assessment uh, analysis to determine whether there's been a breach of protected health information. I know this is getting a little technical, but that would trigger the need for um, a review of the administrative practices because to the extent there is a breach, and you do have to face that, then you want to be able to uh, to go down your checklist of what you've been doing and say, yes, we you know, ensured that the, the person couldn't have received this amount of information because we do this to you know, X, Y, Z to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and kind of going along with uh, the, the last point, the conducting the annual training sessions, that ties directly into those new HIPAA regulations and that risk assessment procedure. Uh, make sure that if you are wanting to be compliant completely, that you are allowing your uh, your staff and, and those who work with you to also be compliant. And that can be something as simple as doing a yearly HIPAA training. Um, it sounds as thrilling as I'm making it sound, I'm sure, but uh, it is something that is quick and painless. And then you've checked the box to say, hey, yes, we've done that. And that will minimize our risk for uh, these levels of breach issues that can come about. Um, 
The last piece, I kind of skipped over this, but it's one that's important, is to ensure that your retirement plan contributions are uh, timely. And that's something that, especially if you have multiple payroll dates that you're administering and that you're responsible for, uh, you know, we've got those DOL specific requirements. And most often, if you are a larger employer, it's going to be required that you immediately transfer those elective deferrals into the plan. And to the extent that that hasn't been happening, Happening, there can be, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a safeguard there, but it's really not very much. And and we, the guidance on it is not very clear, other than to say it needs to be done immediately. And that's oftentimes very hard to do and administer. So make sure that if it is feasible for those uh, plan contributions to be to be submitted in a timely manner, i.e. immediately, that they are in fact being done. And if they haven't been, then go back through and look and see and check off the boxes uh, about what, you know, were there any that we missed and what do we need to do to correct them? And that's something that you can get help with. And it's, an, it's a relatively easy fix, but one that needs to happen. And if you have any questions, then feel free to ask us. So thank you all. Thank you.